Hello, is your heart healthy or is it in trouble? Today, I'm going to talk about the seven signs in your body that may indicate your heart is not 100%. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the world. I'm going to break this video into three parts. The first part is about the seven signs that you can see that something's wrong that you should look for when you're looking for heart problems. In the second part, I'm going to talk about the seven classic symptoms, what you feel when your heart is not doing well. Could you or a family member be feeling them? And finally, I'll give you some valuable tips on how to avoid heart problems in the future. It's going to be a very comprehensive video, so stay until the end, and I'm sure there's a lot you haven't heard before. But first, please like the video, because the more people like it, the more YouTube will distribute it to people who don't have access to doctors or hospitals. Also, please share the video with your friends and family. Many lives can be saved with your help, so share it. Do you have a heart condition? Or do you think you might? What part of the world are you from? Right below. Here we go. What are the seven signs to look for that could indicate you have a heart problem? What are the signs that you can see? Seventh sign, I'm sure you're going to start looking at people's ears more carefully from today on. And why is that? Because there's a little sign in the ear that could indicate that the person has a blockage in the arteries of the heart, the coronary arteries, or the carotid arteries. Seriously, this is true. Back in the 1970s, Dr. Sanders Frank noticed that many of his patients with angina, chest pain, had a diagonal crease in their ear. He called this the Frank's sign. What is the connection between the heart and the ear? One theory is that the same factors that damage the inner lining of the arteries can also cause this crease in the ear. So does everyone with Frank's sign have a blockage? No. Out of a hundred people who have this diagonal crease in their ear, 30 have nothing. It's just a sign of aging. The younger the person, the more likely it is to be a sign of a coronary or carotid blockage. So if a person is 40 years old and has Frank's sign, we have to be more attentive than someone in their 80s who is probably just old. And the sensitivity of this sign is low. In other words, out of 100 people who have heart blockages, only 40 will have this sign. So you can't celebrate if you have a smooth ear. The sixth sign is hair loss on the legs. Hair loss, first on the shins and then on the thighs, can be a sign that you have peripheral arterial disease, which is clogged arteries in the legs. And because atherosclerosis is a diffuse rather than a localized disease, if you have a blockage in your legs, you may also have blockages in other arteries in your body, including the coronary arteries that supply blood to your heart. Most people with peripheral arterial disease do not realize that something is wrong until the atherosclerosis has progressed. And why do they lose their hair? Because hair follicles need nutrients to grow hair. You need good circulation. If your arteries are clogged with fatty plaque, you don't get enough blood and oxygen. In addition to losing hair on the legs, people may experience smoother, shinier skin, cold skin, and reduced nail growth. But let me emphasize that leg hair loss can happen for other reasons, not just peripheral arterial disease. There's genetics. You can lose hair just by rubbing against your pants. Fifth sign, xanthalasma. You may have looked at someone's eyes and noticed a yellow plaque on the upper eyelid. This is called xanthalasma. It doesn't hurt, and it's usually just a cosmetic problem that grows slowly. Xanthalasma is the most common type of xanthema, which are cholesterol deposits in the skin. It is more common in middle-aged women and is located primarily in the inner corner of the eye, most often on the upper eyelid. Approximately 50% of patients who develop xanthalasma have dyslipidemia, high cholesterol, or high triglycerides. Interestingly, only 1% of people with high cholesterol have xanthalasma, but researchers have found that having xanthalasma increases the risk of heart disease, 
heart attack, and stroke. So if you have xanthalasma, you need to have your blood tested and your cholesterol and triglycerides checked to make sure they're not high. Fourth sign, arc senile or halo senile. As the name suggests, this is age-related. It occurs more often in older patients. It is caused by cholesterol deposits on the edge of the cornea and has this white or gray appearance that is visible above or below the outer part of the cornea. In some people, this shadow can take over the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. The person may notice that they used to have a dark eye and now it's getting lighter. Snell's arc does not affect vision and does not require treatment, but there is a catch. When arcus senilis occurs in younger people, before the age of 45, it may be a sign that the person has severe dyslipidemia. In other words, very high cholesterol and triglycerides. In this case, it is associated with an increased risk of heart disease. If you're older and have a senile bow, it's normal. About 60% of people over 60 have it, and after the age of 80, it's almost 100%. So don't worry if you're over 60 and you look in the mirror and see a senile arch. Third sign, cyanosis. Cyanosis is the bluish or purple coloring of the skin. It could be that it's too cold outside and you've turned purple. It could also mean you have a heart or lung problem. If an area of your skin is cyanotic blue or purple when you're hot, it could be a sign that that part of your body is not getting oxygenated blood, which is red. It could be a blocked artery. Now, if the person complains of shortness of breath, it could be a lung problem, pneumonia, emphysema, pulmonary embolism or heart failure, where the heart can't pump enough oxygenated blood. Of course, there are other heart causes, such as congenital defects like tetralogy of fallopian tubes, which cause cyanosis. Second sign, ulcers. Those sores that won't heal on the legs or feet can indicate poor circulation. It could be low blood pressure due to a blockage in the arteries that supply that area. And usually the person won't be able to walk very fast because their legs get tired or sore and they get cramps. Most of the time, these ulcers are painful, but if you have nerve damage, such as diabetic neuropathy, you may not feel any pain. And arterial ulcers usually occur on the outside of the leg, on the heels and toes, and usually don't bleed. Other ulcers are venous ulcers, which are more common in people with varicose veins or venous thrombosis. Unlike arterial ulcers, they appear on the inside of the leg and usually bleed. Before I tell you about the first sign, I'd like to thank all of you who follow us and inform you that in order to improve the quality of our food and homemade recipes, Quick Fix has developed a digital program to help our audience. I'll give you details of this program at the end of this video. Stay until the end. And the first sign, swelling of the legs, ankles and feet. This swelling, or edema, in the legs and ankles can be caused by a weak or enlarged heart, which can cause fluid to build up in the body. You may feel like your shoes don't fit, your sneakers are tighter, your ankle feels fluffy, like bread that's been baked. And when you squeeze, you get that dimple. And you're more likely to notice this swelling in your legs and ankles at the end of the day because gravity increases the pressure on the veins in your legs. And when you lie down and elevate your legs, it also reduces the swelling. And what are the seven symptoms that could indicate a problem with your heart? The first symptom to look for is shortness of breath or dyspnea especially if you are overexerting yourself. It's fatigue that's out of proportion to your effort. You become more breathless the more you do. This could be a heart problem. The second symptom is a persistent cough with white or pink phlegm, which means there is fluid in your lungs or air sacs. It's important not to let this cough go. See your doctor. The third symptom is shortness of breath when you go to bed. You start adding more pillows to see if you sleep better. Over time, you can't lie down and have to sleep in a chair. You may also wake up at night choking, which we call paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. 
That speaks volumes for a heart problem. The fourth symptom is generalized weakness, feeling tired all the time, and difficulty doing everyday activities like shopping, climbing stairs, carrying groceries, walking, and combing your hair. This is because the heart can't pump enough blood to meet the needs of the body's muscles and tissues. Fifth symptom, nocturia. When you go to sleep, you have to get up several times a night to pee. This is called nocturia. It has various causes, but if the heart isn't pumping properly at night, excess fluid needs to be expelled and is expelled during the night. The sixth symptom is called intermittent claudication. When you walk a few feet, you feel pain in your calf. It's not pain all the time, it's when you make an effort, and when you stop, it gets better. This symptom means that the blood doesn't go where it should. When you stop, it gets better. When you walk, it hurts again. Seventh symptom, chest pain. When you have chest pain, the first thing you have to think about is a heart problem. You can't think that it's muscular, that it's gas, or something simple. Could it be? Yes, but you always have to rule out something more serious. Heart pain is pain or discomfort in the chest that lasts more than a few minutes. It can come and go. It may feel like pressure, heaviness, tightness, or burning. It may radiate to the left arm, neck, back, jaw, stomach, or elbows. There may or may not be sweating, paleness, associated nausea, associated dizziness. If you have these symptoms, you must see a doctor as soon as possible. What to do now? How to prevent it? What can you do to prevent heart problems? Get some exercise. Get out of your chair. Don't sit still. Physical activity is very important for your overall circulation, your heart, and your physical and mental well-being. Low-impact exercises such as walking, bicycling, and swimming can improve blood flow caused by chronic blockages in the veins and arteries. If you smoke, quit. Smoking is one of the worst things you can do for your health. It causes impotence, inflames all your arteries, forms fatty plaques, and increases your risk of heart attack, stroke, and dementia. If you are overweight or obese, lose weight. Excess weight raises your blood pressure, worsens your blood sugar, causes inflammation, overloads your kidneys, heart, joints, venous system, increases your risk of thrombosis, and increases fat in your liver. Eat healthy, lots of fruits, vegetables, fiber, whole grains, olive oil, and little red meat. And processed foods. If you have a family history, especially a father, mother, or siblings who have had heart problems, heart attacks, strokes, or heart surgery, you should be more vigilant than other people. If many people in your family have heart problems, you may need more tests. Watch your cholesterol between meals. Eat more oats, cut down on trans fats and saturated fats, lose weight, eat more fiber, exercise, and even if you do everything right, if you still can't lower it, don't get mad at your doctor if he prescribes medication. 80% of cholesterol is made in the liver. Even if you do everything right, sometimes it's not enough. Keep your blood sugar under control. If you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, keep your glucose levels under control. Your glycated hemoglobin, which is the average of the last 10 weeks, must be below 7. Finally, control your blood pressure. Your goal is to keep your blood pressure below 12 over 8. For some, the goal may be less aggressive, such as no higher than 14 over 9. And of course, if you think you have a heart problem, if you've seen various signs and symptoms, if you feel anything I've just mentioned, go to the doctor, explain it to him, and follow his advice. Do you know your blood type? Many people don't. Even if you know the type of blood that flows through your veins, through your arteries, you may not realize that depending on your blood type, you may be more susceptible to certain conditions and even certain diseases than people with other blood types. And there is one blood type that is the most dangerous of all. Do you have that blood type? I hope not. 
In this video, I'm going to tell you all about blood types and the diseases associated with certain blood types. Is blood type nutrition scientifically proven? And you'll learn all about the most dangerous blood type in the world. So stay until the end, because this subject is very important for your health. It would be much easier for hospitals and blood centers if everyone had the same blood type. But that's not the case. How do we know our blood type? Blood groups are determined by the presence or absence of certain antigens. An antigen is a substance that can trigger an immune response when your body recognizes it as foreign. Think of antigens as markers. Our immune system is the gatekeeper. If the immune system recognizes the antigen as its own, it lets the cell through. If it doesn't, the immune system swoops in and destroys the invader. There are several classifications of blood types, but most of us only need to worry about two. The ABO and RH systems. The ABO system is determined by the presence or absence of two types of antigen, A or B, on the surface of red blood cells. A person can be type A if they have an A antigen on their red blood cells, type B if they have a B antigen on their red blood cells, AB if they have both antigens, or O if they have neither an A nor a B antigen. And the classification depends on the presence or absence of a protein called RH factor, which can be present, positive, or absent, negative. These two classifications give rise to the other most common blood groups. A positive or negative, B positive or negative, O positive or negative, AB positive or negative. Do you know what the most common blood type in the world is? It's O positive followed by A positive. And the rarest of those eight blood types is AB negative. So why is it important for us to know our blood type? Especially if we need a blood transfusion or want to donate our blood to someone who needs it. A blood transfusion can mean the difference between life and death. Why would someone need blood? because they've had an accident and bled a lot? If you're going to have major surgery where you're going to lose a lot of blood, sometimes the surgeon will ask you to reserve a few pints of blood in case they need it. Also, for premature babies, for people being treated for cancer or leukemia, for pregnant women who have lost a lot of blood during childbirth, for people who have bled from the intestines or stomach, for people who have thalassemia or sickle cell anemia or very severe anemia. There are many, many reasons for needing a transfusion. And for people with rarer blood types, especially AB negative and O negative, blood bank supplies can be limited. The O negative, although not very rare, is the universal red cell donor because it doesn't have the surface antigens, neither A nor B, nor the RH factor. So the body that receives it can pass it through without any problem, so the O-negative type can donate red blood cells to anyone, and it's the blood that's used most often in emergencies, which is why there's a shortage of it in blood centers. The downside is that O-negative donors can only give blood of their own type. Type AB positive people are universal plasma donors because they don't have circulating antibodies against the A or B antigens, and they are also universal recipients so they can receive blood from anyone. Remember, as your immune system evolves, it will make antibodies against any antigen that you don't have in your own blood. So a person with type B blood who receives type A blood would have an ABO incompatibility reaction, which could even be fatal because the anti-A antibodies present in the patient's plasma would recognize the A antigens on the donated red blood cells, causing the blood cells to agglutinate and block the circulation. How was your blood group determined? Was it inherited from your parents? We inherit one copy of each gene from our father and mother, and that determines our blood type. For example, at home, my blood type is B positive, and my wife's is also B positive. We could only have children who are either B or O because the O allele is recessive, and that's exactly what happened. My daughter is O negative, and my son is B negative. So if a type A had come along, it would have either been switched at the maternity hospital or it wouldn't have been my child. 
In addition to the antigens I've mentioned, there are another 600 known antigens whose presence or absence would create the rarest blood types. Fortunately, the vast majority of us have antigens that don't affect our ability to receive or donate blood. But luck isn't for everyone. Imagine that your blood is so rare, so rare that only one in six million people would be able to help you if you needed a transfusion, if you had an accident, if you needed gonadoport surgery, if you had severe anemia or a more complicated birth. Less than 50 people in the world have this blood type, and at least four of them live in Brazil, and two of them are sisters. And which blood type is considered the most dangerous of all? It's RH null or golden blood. And despite the name, golden blood has no advantages because in addition to being rare, the red blood cells tend to be more fragile than normal. If you are one of the few RH nulls, you cannot receive blood from anyone but the few of the same blood type. In golden blood, there is a complete absence of RH system antigens on the red blood cells. And it is this absence that makes these individuals so rare. And most people who have this blood type don't even know they have it. And do you know what your blood type is? If you don't, how do you find out? Is it a complete blood count? No, because the complete blood count basically just shows us the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. You won't be able to find out your blood type. So if you look through old blood tests, try to find out your blood type. ABO and RH. If you can't find this out, you either need to take a blood test specific to your blood type or you can donate your blood. In addition to finding out your blood type, you can help other people who need your blood. Every time you donate, four lives can be saved. Now I'm going to talk about the specifics of each blood type, but first I want to inform you that I'm going to leave a link for you to click on in the comments below with our herbs and foods program with recipes that explain how to keep your organs healthier so you can prevent future health problems with homemade and natural recipes. There's even a tutorial that teaches you how to grow these herbs at home to improve the health of each of your organs. Take a look and then come back and tell our team what you think, okay? Now I'm going to talk about the blood type diet. Is there any scientific proof? Proponents of this diet claim that depending on your blood type, some foods are better for your health than others. I myself have a patient who says that the diet has greatly improved his life. Where did this come from? From a book in the 1990s called Eat Right for Your Type, which became a bestseller. Basically, he said that type O came from hunters, so people with this blood type needed to eat more protein like meat, poultry, fish, and limit some legumes, similar to the paleo diet, while type A, the second most common blood type, was the agricultural type, which should stay away from red meat and eat a diet close to the vegetarian type B, which he called nomadic. These people could eat plants and most meats, avoiding chicken and pork, and could also eat some dairy products. They should also avoid wheat, corn, lentils and tomatoes, and finally type AB, which he called the enigma a cross between type A and type B. Well, all four diets avoided processed junk food, and maybe that's where some people's improvement comes from. It also links the lecithins in the diet to a specific blood type, which we know is not true. In a major study and review in 2013 that analyzed the effects of this type of diet on health, researchers concluded that there was no evidence to validate the benefits of blood type diets. But is there a link between your blood type and your personality? There was a theory in Japan that your blood type directly affects your personality like the zodiac signs. So type A carriers would be kinder and more demanding, while type B carriers would be optimistic and do their own thing. However, one study found no relationship between blood type and personality. What about disease? Could that be related to blood type? A Harvard study showed that type O has a lower risk of heart disease, while the most dangerous blood type for heart disease is type AB. But look, as a cardiologist, I can tell you that you shouldn't blame your blood type if you have a heart problem. 
More important than that is to check your blood pressure, your glucose, your cholesterol, your lifestyle. Another advantage of type O is that it has a lower risk of stroke, which must be the same as heart attack. But it's not all flowers. It seems that type O has a higher chance of developing ulcers and skin cancer. People with type A blood are more likely to get stomach cancer, which seems to have something to do with agapila. People with type A tend to have higher cortisol, which is the stress hormone. But to be honest, your blood type, my blood type, you can't change it, but our lifestyle can always be improved, exercise more, avoid vices like smoking, reduce stress, try to sleep better, and enjoy your life the way it should be lived. Did you like the video? Click the like button, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on our health tips, and ring the bell. It's very important that you share this knowledge with your friends and family, because when it comes to your health, it's worth sharing, so please do. So what's the next video you're going to watch? I'll leave you with my recommendation. Until the next video, thank you and stay healthy.